All right, well, let me, at least it's, I'm going to start with an introduction, allowing folks to, to get into the room and start the conversation. Hello, everyone. I am Michelle Hausman, the Artistic Director of Miami New Drama. Uh, we are a theater located in the heart of Miami Beach and South Beach on Lincoln Road. As we speak, uh, the theater has frozen in time. The... Uh, the set, costumes, and everything except for the actors of the world premiere musical, A Wonderful World, about the life and music of Louis Armstrong. Um, it's a show that we hope that we'll return to um, as soon as we're allowed to. But so Miami New Drama is a theater company that mainly focuses on creating new work. Um, and, you know, the art of creating new work is not only uh, that of a playwright and a director who you know, create new plays and put them on stage, but mainly the, the weight of that falls on the actors who are creating those new characters. Um, and it is their work that we see when we uh, go to a show. And it's really the work that gets frozen into the collective memory of a certain play. So when that play is done time and time again, in a way, the spirit of those actors who originated that role still live uh, through that production. And in that spirit, I want to give a wonderful warm welcome to an actress, an artist that I admire uh, profoundly. Uh, she will be seen and was seen on uh, the stage of the Colony uh, Theater uh, playing Daisy Parker in A Wonderful World. She's also been seen on Broadway playing a, a variety of roles from Diana Ross um, on a Motown to her work on Memphis and, and other sh a Leap of Faith. Uh, and uh, it is my honor to welcome the great Dion Figgins. Hey, that's me. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle. Thank you for that beautiful introduction. Hello, everyone. I hope you're all well out there. So we're going to have a conversation today about how do you prepare uh, to take on a character. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the actor prepares exactly how. And we're going we're gonna to try to talk through a couple of your real-life experiences of, of uh, different characters that sort of shape your career. Uh, mm -hmm. And then we're going to have a section in which uh, the audience is going to be able to ask questions. But Absolutely. before that, I want to spend just a little bit of time talking about how you got to be an actress. You know, what, was, what was that process, that formation like? And I know that I say an actress, but you really are a, a, a beast of the stage. You're a dancer, you're an actor, you're a singer, you're a choreographer. So I don't, I don't want to try to narrow it by just calling you an actress. <laughs> So how did you become uh, a theater artist? Well, um, you know, I started growing up uh, dancing in the classical form in D.C. Uh, you know, funny note, um, my dance teacher was the same teacher of Cheetah Rivera, uh, Lewis Johnson, Hit and Battle. All of these people came through the same studio that I attended. And so the legacy of theater was already ingrained in me from, you know, very young age. Uh, my first theatrical production, I was understudying Debbie Allen at um, the Kennedy Center. I was understudying in a show called Brothers of the Night. She would do these children's shows, and I just happened to be her understudy in that. And so that was what started to transition me from being just a dancer to now broadening my skill set to being interested in acting. But it wasn't until I left Dance Theater of Harlem um, that I decided it was the time to begin to pursue this theatrical career. Um, I was a ballerina with Dance Theater of Harlem for five years. This mm -hmm. company folded and I was like, well, you know, I've always wanted to be on Broadway. And so I started to audition. But the process of getting to Broadway, you know, I'm a, I was, at this point, I'm a very strong dancer, um, professional dancer. Um, but there were things that I had to go back into the laboratory to learn. I had to start taking voice lessons. And another thing was I had to start taking acting classes because when I was going into the room to audition for theater, while my dancing was very strong, I didn't understand the importance of 
character work inside of the dance um, form and or in, as a singer didn't understand how important it was that singing is just acting to, to music, you know, so I had to go learn how to do those things. And so it took me about a year of just, you know, going back to school, going back to training. Um, and within that year, I had booked my first Broadway show, which was Hot Feet. It was um, a Earth, Wind, and Fire musical, and I was the understudy to the lead of the show. Um, and so, like, for your first Broadway show to, um, for you to be understudying was also, like, you know, a little overwhelming. <laughs> because were you able first... to perform? Were you able to perform? Yeah, oh, my goodness. I was on, I was on all the time because the, the woman who I was understudying, and we were, were peers, um, she was injured a lot because it was a very heavy dance show. Um, and so I was on pretty much as much as she was, you know. Oh. Um, I was on all the time, like Liz Liza Minnelli got to come and see me perform, so I met Liza Minnelli. Um, ben Vereen, the night that he came to see the show, <laughs> I was on as well. So, you know, so I got to perform in front of a lot of really, really notable actors as well. So that was really awesome for my first I, Broadway I, show. I kind of didn't want this to be, uh, you know, your real show because it just don't, never happens like that. Oh, yes, my first Broadway show I was the understudy of the lead and I perform half of the time. It never <laughs> happens. It never I know. happens. <laughs> I know, and that was, that's how it went. And then from there, it just, you know, like I just fell into the world so easily. And then from there, just the project started to roll out and I was able to go to LA and do work and do projects there and, and come back to New York with a Broadway show. And so it's been, it's been a great, it's been a great journey, you know? So that's basically how I got, that's how I began my acting career. Like my first show was at 18 at the Kennedy Center with Debbie Allen. And from there, I was like, okay, I put it in my back pocket, and then when it was time, I pulled it back out, and I was like, okay, now I'm ready to really focus on this. Did you always have your family supporting you to a life in the arts? Yes. Um, awesome. You know, my mom, she, you know, she wanted me to be in dance. I think she wanted to be a dancer, um, and she wanted to train. And so when the time came for me to pick an activity, and I was very clumsy as a child, she put me in dance. And because I had so many people, or because the studio that I was training at had so many notable professionals in the field already it was it you could see that it was possible and my dance teacher who had already I had the same teacher as Cheetah Rivera same teacher as Hinton Battle these are these are people Hinton Battle was my mentor hmm. you know I can call him and like you know so because that was the circle she could see that this was something that could become lucrative for me well that's very lucky of you as well to have that <laughs> Yes, very lucky, very lucky. Um, I mean, obviously, you know, academics, you know, and the academics is important in the arts, you know, like there is a side of this where like script sure. analysis and th those, th those are where academics and the art meet. And so it's important that people are, you know, reading and, you know, being critical thinkers about their art because those things are very helpful. So it wasn't that I just threw away my academic career. It was just that the arts and the academic were able to meet, especially as I began to begin my acting career. Sure, sure. Well, and it's very evident for those uh, uh, who, who were lucky enough to see uh, the sixth performance at a wonderful <laughs> world table. There'll uh, be more. Do, there'll be more. Oh, absolutely. More. There'll be, a, there'll there'll be, be an open-ended run yes, before exactly. we yeah. transfer, before we transfer. And by the way, the lead, Jason Williams, is here in this class. Hi, Jason. That's uh, my heart. That's my husband. Yeah, that's right. And we're probably going to have him at some point uh, to serenade us in a, in a next class. Uh, yes. But, uh, but it, it was very, it, you're, you're a really smart actor. And it's very clear seeing you work, how, you know, you were able to in, both intellectualize that character and then... Uh, made a very uh, emotional performance, but you knew that it was tied to a very smart understanding of the character. It was just a really wonderful performance. Uh, Thank you. I really look forward to be able to seeing it because it's just really, it was really great to, 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 to create a character from scratch. I saw you yes. in the first reading we ever did of the show, all the way <laughs> to what we were able to achieve a year later. Yes. But before we get into that, let's talk about some characters that you found challenging and what was your way into them as an actor? Thus far, 
um, I think the, the most challenging character that I've had to play was Diana Ross. Um, I played, I was the understudy and, and another side note, when I did Motown, I was in the original Broadway company of um, Motown. And when I was hired, I was hired as the dance captain in a swing. Um, when I got into the room, um, someone got injured in the show very quickly. And within that first week, as a swing, I had to step into that woman's sure. role. Within a, I, I was not hired as the Diana Ross understudy for the show. Right. But when they saw how quickly I was able to step, they, they needed another understudy, they only had one. When right. they saw how quickly I was able to step into this role, they asked me, they pulled me aside and they were like, we're, we're really considering you for the Diana Ross understudy, can you come and sing for it? And I, at this point I already have the job. And I go in and I sing for them. And like within that first week of rehearsals, now I'm also the Diana Ross understudy. This does not happen. Like you don't find many people that are a swing in a show, the, <laughs> un the dance captain, and now also understudying the leading lady in the show. Like this, right. I, I don't know that. And I covered 12 tracks in that show. So when it was time for me to begin, we were so lucky already to have um, Valicia Lakay. She played the she was the original Diana Ross, and she was just incredible, you know. So already I'm I'm watching an actress who is doing her homework. Um, so when it came time for me to begin the process, um, this is a real person, you know. Like this is not, and she's alive on Earth. <laughs> so right, 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 you, right. you can't just do whatever you want to do like you can't just begin to recreate history of this person's temperament and personality so what i ended up doing was reading i read about 10 books i read 10 different books i read the book barry gordy wrote about diana ross and i read two books one that diana ross had written about herself another book that someone had written about diana ross i read the supremes i read marvin gay i read the temptations like i read pretty much the entire history of Motown um, from the artist's perspective. Um, and, and what I did was I started to look at what Diana Ross thought about herself versus what other people thought about Diana Ross. Right. Because those two things are not the same, right? So like we have an idea of who we think we are and then there's the idea of what other people think about us and that starts to um, motivate and starts to inform the behavior of the character for me so um and it also makes there there's duality in that right so it's never just oh she's you know diana ross everyone thought that she was an uber bitch like you know she was <laughs> very um very motivated she was very single-minded in her pursuits she would you know according to everyone else she would run you down she would steal your costume she was a diva like this is the word from their perspective but from diana ross's perspective diana ross was just trying to get to the top diana ross comes from the projects diana ross has somewhere that she she knows that she has something special and she's not going to allow anybody to get right. in her way those are two very different stories that need to be told at the same time. So it needs to be true that Diana Ross is very motivated and um, has a purpose, but it also needs to be true that from the outside looking in, it could look like she will stab you in your back. <laughs> well, and you, you're you very good at that, aren't you? <laughs> so was, was she involved at all in the... In the no no one like the thing is is that mr gordy he took on this project um he wanted to bring as he would say he wanted to bring motown to broadway not broadway to motown so he wasn't interested in doing a broadway show he was interested in doing a motown, motown show, show on broadway and so a lot of the, you know, I'm, I mean, obviously when it was time when we did the opening night, everyone's there, Stevie Wonder's there, you know, Diana Ross is there looking fabulous, um, Smokey, all of them, everyone's there. Amazing. But none of them were involved in the process. Like, I, I, I'm, I think Smokey might have been the only person that Mr. Gordy was like really consulting with during the time because a lot of people, um, 
took issue with how they decided to portray certain characters. And so, you know, as much as uh, I think the Motown family, the, the original Motown artists, they appreciated um, being um, recognized in the art, I think they also, some of the characters like a Marvin Gaye, um, you know, they, they took, I think Mr. Gordy took liberties oh, that liberty some sure. people did not appreciate. Um, he was very protective of how he portrayed Diana Ross. Very. Well, you know, um, <laughs> as you can imagine why. So, um, <laughs> but for me coming in and knowing that I'm an understudy and knowing that, um, you know, like I, I see the, the complexities of this woman, right? Like I see that she, she has, she has, um, she has a goal in mind and there's a lot of people who are telling her she can't get there, you know? So sometimes when people are like that, you have to, you, you have to become what others would deem a bitch because you have a singular focus and you're not gonna be deterred. Um, and so that was really, for me, developing that character, it was really important to get that message across, you know, that she's, she's very focused and she's not gonna be deterred from her goal, even if other people think that she will stab you in the back. Right. So when, when you're working with a character, one, you know, based on, on, on an existing figure or, or you know a character of a Greek tragedy, or do you have any, you know, do you do any sort of exercises? Are you is there any uh, technique that you favor? Um, yeah, I mean, so after I do my initial research, like when I sit down with a script, um, so and tell I, us about I, that I, first reading of us. Like you, you okay, just yep. describe. describe yep. Is there any? Uh, process to that first read or absolutely so when I get the script I try to stay away from the trappings of immediately going to my character right right and try to find out what the idea of the play is like this is something my acting coach is always talking about what is the overarching idea of the play what is the overarching message of the play because then after I've read it for my own enjoyment and for my own understanding of what the entire piece is about. Then when I start to go back to my character, I can understand how my character, what role they play in bringing forth that entire idea. Which is, which is so important, you know, uh, uh, sometimes actors get so into what, you know, so obsessed with their characters that they forget right. that the characters play a role in a bigger, in a, in a bigger Right, role. You, like you the know? character, has to serve like the any story. character that I play, I'm I'm it's in service in to service the entire the story, piece. Huh? You know, so like even in the process of like, you know, receiving notes and you know it there's a lot of ego in the work. So I always say let me take my ego and put it in my pocket because this is yeah. not about my individual effort. This is in you know this is not a one woman show this is a show with multiple characters that ha in the show in and of itself has an idea that needs to be brought forth. How can I serve that? So like, I like to think of myself in service to the work as sure. opposed to like, I'm my own individual person and I got to get my shine. Like that's not how I like to do my process. Um, so when I get my script, I mm -hmm. read it, understand, try to understand what the show in and of itself is about. And then I go into, you know, marking up my script, like just, just doing the basic, like, hey, these are my lines, you know, this is what I do. After I figure out, okay, this is what I do, you know, before I've even gotten in the room, this is pretty much what I do, like, okay, that's what it is. And then I learn my lines like a robot. Like, I don't try to learn my lines, like, infusing them with character and like right. I've already figured it out because I haven't figured it out. I don't know who this person is yet. So when but I at start least you want to get the lines out of the way. Get, yeah, I try to start learning my lines as soon as possible. Even before because, rehearsal begins? As soon as possible. Like, That's I mean, right. I, you That's know, it's right. hard to be off yeah. book. But what, what it does is just frees me up from trying to pull and find the words. That's, I could not agree with you more. That's that. Uh, my experience is that the best process possible is when the actors sort of come in already more or less off book, not, not knowing exactly how the lines, why the lines, but knowing the lines. It Just knowing them. It frees you up 
to, to an investigation, to an exactly. exploration that will give a much better, richer product. I could not agree more. That's, with that's how I like to do my process. Yeah. It's like, just learn the lines, be familiar with them. Just be, it, even it's a familiarity of like the words, you know, and like just knowing where they all fall in the script. Like I'm very, so that, cause I don't like, like table work I think is so important, but at a certain point, I need my physical body to start physicalizing the um, sure. actions because Absolutely. acting is acting. It's actions. It's, it's, it's word. The words are in motion. This is an, this is an active practice. This is not like a study. Like that's where academia starts. Like you have to be like, okay, because at a certain point I have to actually stand up and find the physical body of this character. You know, like some of the actors that I admire the most are the ones who transform physically into the character where you can't even, you know, it's them playing, you know, you know the actor's name, but they become so much their character because physically they just take on another physical form. Um, and the only way to kind of do that work is to be able to get up out of the seat and start to move in the body of the actor. How does this, how does this character move how you know what are their gestures like are they you know like for daisy for daisy parker you know i realized okay here's a woman who's a sex worker you know in in new orleans let, let, let's put a pause if you want to let, let's just put a pause we're going to talk about daisy parker okay okay so so the script so the script so i'll go back to the script so <laughs> learn the lines you know as quickly as possible and learn them like just you, you don't need to throw intent at it we're not at acting yet we haven't even gotten right. to acting we're right. just throwing the intent. And then I start to look, then I take my script as I'm learning my lines and I start to highlight context clues. Um, where's this woman from? What's her background? What's her economic status? Um, what, what are the things that other characters are saying about her versus what she's saying about herself? So you go through the script and you also look at everything that, you, you highlight when, when you speak and then you highlight when somebody says something about the character. That's wonderful. Any clues that can clue me into where we are, it's the who, what, when, where, why, how right. of the acting, right? Like anything that's in the text that can inform me of where I am, who I am, who other people think I am versus who I think I am, why I'm saying these lines, what my relationships are to other people. Like any questions that I can find as well as any, um, any like historical information, the dramaturgy of the text, right? Like, you know, this takes place when this song was on the radio. Well, what's this song? Sometimes you'll see in a script, there'll be music or there'll be, you know, especially when you're dealing with like real life characters like a Daisy Parker or a Diana Ross, right? These are real people who lived in a real time. So this was playing on the radio. This was what was, I go and I look all those things up. Anything that I can look the time up. Of, that's great, that's great. Anything that can be researched, um, for instance, um, for Diana Ross, uh, you know, like I looked at a lot of like the hairstyles that were, they were wearing at the time, the clothing that they were wearing at the time. I'll come into the studio wearing what, like, you know, wearing something that puts me in the body of my character. You know, um, I watched Valicia LaKay when we did Diana Ross. She dressed up as Diana Ross every day. Every day she had on a 60s style outfit or when we moved into the 70s, she had on a 70s style outfit. Some people can say it's excessive, but if, if that puts you in the body of your yeah, character, it's what you need talk, to yeah, do. It's, uh, it's silly for somebody. You, you do whatever you need, need to, to do. do. You do whatever you need to do. You know, so, um, and so yeah, looking for the context clues in the script that will tell me more about my character, where she is, um, is it hot, is it cold? You know, so then I start to deal with my environment. You know, I start to deal with the sense memory of the, the play. Um, what time of year is it? Um, you know, what are the smells that are around her? Um, what, what is she hearing? Like all of the, like all of the things that are going to make this character start to churn, you know, like you, you start to, uh, we, we forget about the senses. Sometimes we forget that like when you're in a brothel, 
there's probably a smell. What is that smell? Is it hot? What, how hot is it? You know, like those things start to affect the, the character and the work in a way that now I can take the pressure off the lines. Now, yeah. now I'm starting to develop the acting of the work, right? Now I know my lines. I know where I am. I know what, you know, I know who this, I'm starting to develop an understanding of who this person is. So now I can start to say the lines with some intention because I've got something to pull from. I've got some life going on in the world. It's not just the text. The text is the, text is the last, um, it's the first thing you learn, like for me at least, I wanna learn it, but it's the last thing I'm worried about. Like I'm not worried about the text. I'm gonna learn my lines. I've never not like I've never gone onto the stage and not known my lines. Like toy, toy, I'm toy, working. Toy. <laughs> Don't jinx yourself. Don't no jinx, jinx yourself. No jinx. No jinx. But you know, like yeah. you know, because you, you the repetition of it, you end up knowing them. You're gonna do the scene over and over and over again. But what's more important is like what am I? Finding. What am I actually saying? And so, so there's. So go I'll ahead. Ask you. As you're looking at, at the text, are you trying to also find where the conflict is? What, what, what does my character want what? in this, in the overall arc and on the specific scene? Absolutely. Do you highlight like action verbs? How, you know, do you? Um, I'm, I'm less, uh, you know, for me, I try to discover what my character wants really like really early you know like that's that's like initial work it's like what what is my character one is it overall but what I'm trying to do every time I open my mouth or do anything is make sure that everything I do is justified so in order to do that I do have to figure out okay with every line what am I seeking to gain when I say this like what what do I want when when I finish saying this what am I hoping to get out of this what am I trying to um, how am I trying to get my partner, whoever my partner is in the scene, to feel when I say this thing? Um, and so, yeah, there is a lot of, I, I don't take anything for granted. You know, like every line has to, has a meaning. There's a reason why the writer wrote it. Yeah. You know, so like, and that's why sometimes the writer comes through with the scissors. It's like, we don't need that. Cause and you're like, no, we are. It, no, truly. I'm like, I needed that. And then you realize you didn't need that. Like you really don't need that extra fat. You can get rid of that. And so I'm definitely always trying to justify everything. Why I like, even when we start moving around on the stage, why do I walk from there to there? What is this, what does this serve? Um, so that work goes along with the, like, just breaking down. Like, I mean, you, if you look at my script, it's just a, uh, it looks like a battlefield. Like there's just ideas and slashes. And sometimes I'll slash things out because I'm like, I'm going to say this, but this is just extra stuff. Like I just, you know, like let me, what, what is my intent for saying these things? Um, what is the conflict that I'm having um, in, in the scene? So absolutely, like you're always trying to justify every single moment that you have on the stage. So it's a good segue to go into Daisy Parker. Now, so Daisy Parker is the first wife out of four of Louis Armstrong. Um, and in the play that Oren, the musical that Oren Squire wrote, um, the wives act as a form of the Greek chorus that sort yes. of na narrates uh, the story of Louis Armstrong. So there's a challenge in that in which you are in a way an observant uh, of the story and a teller of the story and, mm -hmm. uh, and in the next breath you are in the story living and feeling and suffering the story and then taking yeah. a step back and just telling us about the story um, so that is the context of of the of that character uh, of Daisy Parker yeah. um, but tell us a little bit more about her who is she uh, Days of she, when she start, you know, I just, you know, I love Daisy Parker so much. Um, and I love playing characters like this because they're, you know, they're the toss aways, you know, like they're like, you know, like Daisy Parker is a sex worker. Um, she's Lewis's first wife. He meets her, um, he meets her in the brothels. 
you know, where they both frequent, um, mostly because that's where they grew up. More, more so Lewis grew up in that environment, um, working. And Daisy Parker, actually, like when I started to read about her, because again, there's no, there's no account of Daisy Parker from Daisy Parker. The only accounts there are of Daisy Parker are from Lewis. And so the way Lewis <laughs> describes her um, in a book that he wrote, um, <coughs> about her. So again, for Daisy Parker, I read what I, you know, could find. Um, there was a book that Lewis, there was a few books where he's talking about her. Um, and in this one book, he describes her as spoiled. Apparently her parents, you know, she was spoiled growing up and, you know, she, she, they didn't make her go to school. She didn't have much, very much education. She couldn't really read. Um, and so, but then there's not more than that. Like that's how he describes her as a person and how, you know, sh how, how she was as a young woman. Um, and so I take that information. So there's when she was with her family and now she's in a brothel, what happened? You know, like I've got here, I've got till she's like 14. And then at 16, she's a, a prostitute. Between these two spaces, something happened. Because a young woman who has a family that's spoiled, spoiled her, her is not going to go into a sex uh, industry. Right. So then what happened? So like, so now that's where my own imagination starts to churn up. And I, and I start to imagine, well, okay, um, sex work, you know, a lot of women that get into sex work also have very early experiences with sexual experiences, often traumatic. Um, this is a time when in New Orleans, at least, you know, I, I went ahead and I read this book, Storyville, New Orleans. And this basically talks about everything that was happening in Storyville where prostitution was legal in the red light district there. Um, and I start to fill in the blank with, with just historical information about what I know is going on in New Orleans at that time. People were selling their children into prostitution. People were stealing children into prostitution. Um, so there's a lot of ways in which Daisy Parker could have ended up as a prostitute. But what I decided, because eventually you have to make a decision because there's choices, mm -hmm. I decided that Daisy Parker had a very early traumatic experience with sex. And she's already spoiled and rebellious and she runs away from home and she decides, okay, well, this is what I'm doing. I'm, I'm not learned. I don't know how to read. There aren't very many options. I'm going to, and she's beautiful. Obviously. <laughs> so <laughs> she's a beautiful Creole <laughs> girl. And so she decides this is an easy thing to do and other people are doing it. So that's what I'm going to do. You know, um, but I had to fill that in because that wasn't something that was given to me. Yeah. You know, so now I'm justifying from the top of the show, I've justified why I'm here, you know? So like that wasn't something that was written in any script anywhere, but I needed to understand why Daisy Parker is here to begin this journey with Lewis. Um, and then from there, you know, I have the text that starts to lead me and I'm, I'm narrating what's happening to Lewis, but what's happening to Lewis is also happening to me. You know, so um, Louis, I, I'm very close to Louis Armstrong um, as a as a person, you know, not even as my character, but because Daisy Parker and him come from the same place. And I made an early decision that Daisy Parker was Louis's, even though that's not given in the script, I was like, she was the one who had Louis's back the most. Because when Louis had nothing, when he was nobody, she loved him anyway. And Lewis, for me, represents a hope that I never thought I was going to have. You know, like you're a sex worker. You know, you don't think that you're going to ever meet somebody and they're going to love you. They know you're a prostitute. Who wants to marry a prostitute? Like, that just sounds crazy. So here comes this young kid, and he's looking at me not like a hoe. You know, so like, these are things that I had already decided for myself and thank God I'm working with a partner like Jason, who is giving me this information as well. But I had decided that Lewis represents hope to Daisy in a world where there's none. So I want to just do a quick pause here just to, just to expand this a little bit to our participant today about 
you know, all that we heard now in the last seven minutes talking about this character is not on the page, but it, it, it also is not not on the page. Meaning that nothing, right. nothing that you've researched and you've decided to create is working against what Orange Squire wrote. Right. Um, right. I think, and this is really important. Uh, you know, when I, there's a couple of things that is really exciting about how uh, Daisy Parker works. One is that a lesser writer and a lesser actor would have made her a cliche because she is screaming to be a cliche. She yeah. is temper oh, yeah. as a racer, right? And she wants to, you know, you make her angry and she takes her razor out. So it, it's just so easy. Yeah. Just, you know, but under the pen of Warren Squire and under uh, your, uh, your acting, she really comes as a three-dimensional character yeah. with a lot of color and all that. But, the, you, you know, the important amount of work that you did to complement the writing is really that space that it's the actors and the actors only realm in which you can really create an outstanding memorable performance yeah so as people are listening to this conversation think of that space as sacred territory that you have um of of us of a space where you you get to be uh an artist who gets to to write this character. And in reality, nobody, not even the playwright and not even the director, were never going to think as much as the, about the character as the actor. Is that part, to. that part is so important. I say that all the time. The actor has to be the authority on the character, has to, has to, has to. Everyone can have an idea, and that's like the director's gonna have an idea. Obviously, the writer has an idea, but the the actor has to be so committed to being true and honest to the character that they take every step necessary to become the authority on that character. And you have to fight for it, you know, like there uh, you get in the room, and because everyone has an idea of the character, Sometimes what my idea of the character is not necessarily the director's idea or the writer's right. idea. In order for me to step into that conversation with the director and the, the writer, I need to be so knowledgeable about my character and so justified in my actions that I feel confident that when I step in, I say, well, I think that what's actually happening here for Daisy is this. I've, I'm coming with a lot of information. I'm coming with a lot of research. I'm not just stepping into the conversation because right. I want to serve what right. I want to do. And sometimes it's a losing battle, but also Chris, you know, working with a director that has the expectation that the actors have done their homework, right? For a creative like me, someone who wants to develop characters and I don't, I don't necessarily want to have a lot of hands on it either. Like right. I'm, I, you know, I'm just the type of actor where I'm just like, let I will figure it out. And there were plenty of mornings. Like I can name so many mornings when we were in Miami where I would wake up with a Eureka moment at five in the morning. Like Eureka, I figured <laughs> it out. And I'm in the room doing like all these exercises. I do a lot of um, just speaking about exercises. I do a lot of physical exercises to um, get like my my engine going. So like when I wake up and I'm like, Eureka, I'm starting to like, well, where is she? And I'm pacing around and I'm thinking, what happened before this moment? How do I justify this moment? How do I justify pulling out this knife? Right. Why am I pulling out this knife? Have I had to pull out this knife before? I mean, a lot of the information that I learned from through my research was that Daisy, when she met Lewis, was in an abusive relationship. So this is the woman that's used to being slapped around. This is the woman that's used to being hit. She's think, in a violent environment. So pulling out a knife for her is justified. Like that's how that's her language of love. That's how she that's how she speaks. You know, I was doing a little exercise as we were talking about it. I was say, thinking to myself, what is Daisy's overarching want? What does she want? And, and I came up with this idea that I don't know if, how it resonates with you, but I think that she wants 
agency and control over her own happiness. Yep. That's you exactly know, what Daisy wants. That's exactly what Daisy wants. Daisy, Daisy wants to exist in a world where she can call the shots for herself. Right. She can call her own shots and she can be her own woman. Because as you know, like if you notice about the, the thing about Daisy, that she never changes. Even when she goes to Chicago, she tries to like, she's like, I'm not going to cut Lil Harden when I go to Chicago. I'm not going to cut her. Lil Harden is, just for everyone's um, reference, Lil Harden is Louis Armstrong's second wife. Yeah. And, and I would she, say her overarching, I would say her, or, what she wants is recognition. Which mm -hmm. is different yes. than aid. She wants recognition, recognition of the fucking genius she is. Yeah, because she, cause, cause she's taking ownership. Like all the stuff that happens in the first act. I mean, the first chapter when you see Louis Armstrong, and now he's starting to get a name for himself. And the reason why I chose to become so invested in that and so emotional in that when he's on the riverboat and I'm watching it and I'm so, I'm so happy is because it's happening to me. I'm a part of that. I You're did a part that. of that. I did that. That's my man. I, you know, what I'm saying I'm taking ownership of the fact that when this happened to this man when he was nobody when he was selling you know coal on the street i got with him and then when he got with me he took off so we are we're developing that together so i'm taking ownership of his success in that moment as my own so as i'm watching him i'm thinking about like wow like look what we did right you know it's a way for daisy parker to assert herself in a world where everyone's been like you're a discard Sure, sure. You don't go here, you know, as a way for me to say, but look, look what we did. That's my man, you know, like, and that's very much how women in that time period also, like, if you didn't have a husband, you probably were a prostitute. If you didn't have some, a man giving you agency, right, then right. you probably were at the bottom of the barrel. Of society. Sure, absolutely. You know, so, um, yeah, Daisy Parker definitely wants to be recognized. And so when she meets Lil, his second wife, and Lil is looking down on her, Daisy Parker doesn't back down because she's right. not ashamed. Like, she's, sure. she's proud. Daisy Parker has survived in a world where she, she, she probably shouldn't have survived. Right. She's a survivor. So she has nothing to be ashamed about, you know? Um, and that's what makes Daisy Parker, like, for me, in developing the character, I knew how easy it would have been to just become some, like, sure. comic relief. I knew that that, like, that would have been such an easy choice. But I also recognize that like sex workers, we, we often, that's how we do them, right? We like, we say, oh, she's like, she's a toss away, you know? And for me, it's like, I wanted, I, it was really important for me to give dignity to these women that have to survive in this way. You and know? it's in that space that, that you were talking about, that space in between where a, playwright stops her job and the actor begins her that that that, that, that it's it's a sweet spot for an actor to really develop something exciting absolutely we're going to, we're going to start with the q a section soon okay. but before that i want to sort of talk about something else which is very interesting about your career is that you really mm, are a theater artist you stand your own ground as a dancer, as a singer, as a choreographer, as an actor. Has it been hard for you, you know, to try to uh, live beyond the labels that the industry very much likes to put people? Yes, um, I, absolutely it's been challenging. Um, I mean, obviously I've, I've had an incredible career, you know, like, so it's, it has, it's never stopped my success, but particularly as an actor, um, you know, there, when people look on the page of your career, um, they don't take into account your, necessarily the experiences that you've gained and the knowledge that you've gained from being on all these in all these other rooms right they just look to see whether you played the roles or not mm -hmm. um but you know i've been fortunate 
to have been in many a director session with directors of note because I'm on the other side of the table as the choreographer. I've been in audition rooms watching actors um, audition because I'm, you know, I'm the assistant choreographer. So that has given me knowledge about this craft that a lot of other artists don't have. And that doesn't necessarily get taken into account. So I've definitely gone in and auditioned and I've had people kind of like, like, you know, it's not a bad audition when people are like, they're trying to figure it out. They're like, okay, so, well, <laughs> well it says here that you choreographed this and you used to be a dancer with Dance Theater of Harlem. And I see that you were associate choreographer on this. And they're just looking at you, trying to figure out where you fit. Well, I think because you've been, listen, you, you've not only been an associate choreographer, but you've been an associate choreographer to, you know, people like Sergio Trujillo, who's right. a, a freaking right. god of dance. You know, he, right. he's a modern day, I mean, this is a real deal. Yeah, so, yeah, so you, no, he's truly. And so people, a, a lot of people's limited understanding of, of, I don't even know if I would call it, it's just, they don't think it's possible. Like, it's just not like, you know, and then there's the the whole, can you, like, I'm so grateful. I just have to say for a moment to Miami New Drama and Christopher Renshaw, because, you know, I came in for a cold read for this. I just want to even talk about how I got in the room. I came in to do a cold reading of this when you all needed to just hear the word. <laughs> That's you know, right. they were like, we just need to hear what it sounds That's like. That's right. You know, and because because I'm always fighting against my resume, which very much is like, she's a stellar dancer. She can cover all the parts in the theater. She can understudy, you know, like, it, but what it doesn't necessarily always say is that she can carry the show. She can create a show. And she can create a character from scratch. Like that, I, you know, like I'm still developing that understanding, even though I've done that work. It's like you still, because the dance, you know, like when you have a dance career as a ballerina, like people immediately put you in that box and people think that dancers can't speak. So when that opportunity came up to do that cold read, I didn't take that lightly. I said that that script came to me at 10 o'clock. I stayed up until 1130 reading that script. For, so I could go in there the next day and know what the hell I was talking about. Like, mm -hmm. I don't take any type of opportunity like, like that lightly. And I read that script. And when let I came just, in that room... Let me just pause that just for a second, because that's another important advice, uh, is that you take everything. Don't, you know, work hard at every small opportunity. That every one because that's yeah. that's why that i'm here really... michelle that's why i'm here like right. i know that if you know like first of all the pool of actors to audition for this it would have been very competitive sure so the fact that i came in to a cold read nailed it like and you know nailed it nailed, nailed, it, nailed it. it absolutely and they just were like you there were there were other there's other actresses that have sure. more credits than me you know what i'm saying that have done this kind of there's there's other people but I came in and I was so prepared and ready. Yep. And they said, no, we don't need to see anybody else. We're going to yep. hire her. Right. Yep. And so that opportunity set me up to now be able to develop this character and do this work with you and see this piece all the way through to the finish line. Um, but had I not come into that cold read like that, had right. I just been like, oh, it's just a whatever. Yeah and just shown up and not cared about it, I might not be sitting here talking to you right now. I could not agree more. And that, and that you know, is so, a piece of, you know, really work, take everything with, with the spirit of a learner, of somebody who wants to, to do the most out of it, because yeah. those are the moments in which opportunities happen. I could not agree more. So the good segue to our question and answer second. Yes, so we can do this in, in a different ways. There's a Q&A box for people to ask questions. There's also a way to raise your hand and we can sort of bring you up to the panel and talk to you. And now the questions can be about anything, about, uh, about the on live. You know, it can also be about a character that you are developing and you sort of want some advice, some specific. Um, uh, so if, if there's anyone uh, who wants uh, uh, to start, 
raise your hand. If not, I'm going to hear uh, start with a question from John Dalton, who says, who or how do you decide or what is your measuring stick as to when you are talking about how you feel about a situation for your character and your research is worth fighting for? Mm -hmm. So when I, I'm assuming what you mean is like, when is the right, when do you feel like it's justified to speak up about your character to the director or the, the writer? Um, you know, I am the type of person that believes in open communication at all times. So, you know, I'm not really, I'm not one to like fight with someone, but I always ask questions, you know, like, and I'm not a big person on like, let me just ask a question in front of the whole room. But I am very much about like, let me pull the director over, or let me pull the writer over and I'll just ask them the question. Like, I think we, um, I, you know, like, I don't think anything ever needs to be a fight. You know, I think that the, the work that we do in the room is collaborative. Yes. And I know sometimes it doesn't feel like that because I know often there are creatives that, you know, are um, leading the room more like a dictatorship than right. they are collaboration. But, you know, again, you know, like we were talking about with agency, it's important that actors have agency to speak up, you know, um, and it's important when you speak up that whatever you say is, is for the purpose of serving the show and not your own self-interest, because right. that's when it becomes an issue. If you're trying to like, I'm not interested in doing that. I'm not singing as many songs as this person. I'm not, ha I don't have as many lines as this person. This moment needs to be about me. Like that's not how I ever want to approach the conversation. I always want to approach the, any conversation that I have with how how best can i serve this show this moment and is what i'm doing right now the best service for right. this moment if you approach your work like that at all times there'll never be a fight right if you always approach your creatives in a way that shows them that what you're most interested in is being as honest and truthful to the moment and the show as possible you'll you'll have a better better chance of like seeing some of your choices make it to the stage and, 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 and as a director i can't say how important it is when an actor because that's what i said before like i understand that when i hire a room of professional actors those actors have thought way more about their character than i have so it is so important to really listen and have discussions you know, all of them are obviously about what is the most important for the story, but really understand that those actors have spent hours and hours and hours yeah. on an artistic uh, uh, exploration that you've done only a portion. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think mm -hmm. that it's important to always acknowledge. So we have yeah. uh, Robert Ball, once who, he raised his hand, so we're going to allow him to talk. Uh, here, uh, that's, that's what the bottom set permits. Okay, Robert. Uh, can you hear us? I can, yes. Can you hear me? Hello, Robert. We can, uh, we can hear you, yes, sir. Um, okay, so my question is, I, before, unfortunately, the shutdown of everything, I started work on a brand new show at the Stratford Festival. Um, Wonderful. And character. Thank you, yeah. And the, so the character, is basically without going into the entire show the character is a lot like me <laughs> um mm -hmm. and even the writer and the director say that the character is more like me than i even think but <laughs> then there, <laughs> but then there are also some significant different differences that um i'm conflicted with so it, it makes it hard for me to approach it as me if that makes sense okay and then there's also a 30 year span of flashing back and forth, telling the past and the present. And my storyline is a uh, uh, love story. So we break up, we get back together, a lot of that. So I guess my question is how do you approach or how would you approach or any advice you would give to a scenario like that? So let, let me just unpack it a little bit to make sure that we're, yeah. so, so there are two yeah. issues. One issue is how to approach a character that is a little bit too much like you we're right. taking the space to sort of look at it as, a, as something foreign for yourself. It's hard to, to mm -hmm. 
to get to. And then the other part of your question is, how can you, you know, do a span of 30 years of storytelling with your, with your own body? That, that's more or less the two questions? That's exactly right, yeah. Great, thank okay. you, Robert. All right, Dion, what do you think? Well, one with the, you know, how, do you, how would I approach um, a character that's so much like me? Um, you know, I had my partner ask me earlier, what do I think, um, the, what's the most important thing I learned as an actor? And um, I told him that vulnerability is not a weakness. I think sometimes when we have to portray ourselves on, um, on stage or we feel like this character is so much like me that people are going to see me, it starts to become frightening. Because, you know, like, there's, there's things about us that we don't want everyone to see. There's things about us that we don't necessarily want to um, acknowledge in order to get into the work. Like, I don't necessarily, maybe there's things about the character that's like, that feels like me, but I don't like that thing. Right. That starts to go into your own personal self-work, you know, like, unpacking the things that you see in the character that you don't like. And then starting to unpack, like, well, what can I, what can I start to do about that? Because right. I could tell you, I could tell you that you can say, okay, you know, well, maybe I can think about portraying this character. I know somebody else that also acts like this. So how would John do this? Like, how would John approach this? Right. But it's a much stronger choice if you can find a way to unpack the things in the character that you see about yourself that you are uncomfortable bringing to the stage for yourself first. Right. You know, like this work that we do is so personal um, and can start to bring up a lot of personal things. So you have to have a self care regimen for yourself as an actor to um to take care of yourself in the emotional work that you have to do and the emotional work that's going to come up so it sounds like there might be some and i could be wrong and, and tag back in if i'm wrong but it sounds like there might be some things in the character that you recognize in yourself that you're uncomfortable with and i encourage you to put the character away for a second and just deal with that just deal with that because we have to do things on stage sometimes that we aren't comfortable with. Like sometimes you have to, oh, go ahead, Robert. Yeah, no, you, um, you're absolutely <laughs> right. I think, that's, I think that's great. But the biggest part of it is that it really deals with the relationship, the love interest. Um, mm -hmm. My conflicts have been that there are choices that I don't think I would have made, but I think that that's po possibly, as you say, uncomfortable because maybe I need to take a retrospective look. Maybe I would have made those choices, but I'm not looking at it from the outside opposed to being in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also like realize that like, if your character is making choices that you wouldn't necessarily make, lean into that. Because there are things that like, I, you know, as my character, Daisy Parker, I have to pull a knife out on people. I've never pulled a knife out on people, on anyone, or hit anyone in their face. But don't you think I've wanted to hit somebody in their face? Yes. And maybe, yes. You know, like, yes. I haven't yet. But, like, <laughs> but like if I'm being honest, there have been times where I wanted to just go across somebody's whole head. You know? So, like, I can actually use my character as an opportunity to heal some of that. You know? Like, I'm, I'm taking the opportunity to say, I've never done this, but I've always wanted to. You know, I've met, never made that choice, but... I've kind of always wanted to and kind of indulge in this world of pretend in a way that's safe. I'm allowing my person to do things that my person has never done before. Right. Does that okay. make sense? Like, yeah. So, sense that? I, I think, well, let, why don't we also uh, talk Touch about on the, thir the, th the, 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 how do you do 30 years? So, I mean, the, that one's a little more challenging because I'm imagining you're going 30 years into the future and then coming back and you know, like you're how old or however old you are. So you haven't never been 30 years older than you are right now, but you have family members that have been 30 years older than you are right now. You have, there are other people in your life that you have that are 30 years older than you are now. So what I would do is I would talk to those people about their experiences with love 
as they progressively get older. Like sometimes we have to do research that requires us to like talk to people and say, what's your experience about this? Cause I don't have any experience with this. You know, sometimes it, it takes going outside of yourself and your own understanding to say, like if I was, ha if I had to play a drug addict, I never been a drug addict before. So I need to go talk to a drug addict. Like, right. you know, um, so if you need to, you know, talk to someone who has had the experience of having a 30 lo year love story or older, uh, older actor that you can talk to that maybe could, you know, sometimes it just takes you having those type of conversations. I'm not certain if I'm understanding the timeline of the going back in the fourth. Go ahead, Robert. Yeah. Um so it's a it's an on again off again love relationship and it mm -hmm. starts in the present day um but the present day is me or the character at 60 where i'm in my 30s and then it yeah. flashes back to these uh characters these other characters lives going back 30 years and 20 years and then ending again in the present day yeah i think two things i think i think talking to some older people who are in relationships, if you have anybody in your life like that, could be helpful. But I think also, you know, our imaginations are much stronger than we think. So maybe imagine what you would want your love relationship to be like when you're 60. Like what will your, like, I like to project myself into the future. And like, even though I'm not there now, I'm like, when I'm 60, this is how I'm gonna be. When I'm 60, this is how I'm going to carry myself, you know? So there's the two things. There's the one talking to people who are actually there so that you have somewhere to pull from, but then also just imagining what your 60-year-old self would do would in that like. situation. That's great. Uh, uh, that's great. And I think also specificity of movement. Specificity is really, you know, if you don't yeah. have, a, you know, wigs, et cetera, et cetera, that you really don't need. You, it's always nice to have, but then it's always the specificity of those choices. Yeah. It's going to tell the story to an audience of where we are. Um, and that, you know, so thank you, Robert. It was thank great. Thank you, Robert. Um, and, and much luck, whatever it is that we're all yes. back to, to doing theater, we, we wish you uh, to break a leg. Uh, yes. Although, don't take it too <laughs> seriously. I, I just broke mine uh, a few weeks ago, so. Um, you know, mucha mierda, as we say in the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, so we, we have another question from an anonymous attendee that says, you mentioned that Daisy Parker could have easily been a cliche in the wrong hands. Actually, I mentioned that. She didn't. I mentioned that. When, talk, when taking on the role, did you ever feel you were pushing or reinforcing a dangerous stereotype? If so, did you, what did you do to get past that fear? and take on a role and ensure you were not doing that. Yeah, so that's, you know, as a woman, obviously, um, that's that frequently comes up because we're frequently asked to do things that could potentially reinforce a dangerous stereotype. Um, this is the second time in my career where I've had to play um, someone that's involved in the sex work. Um, first time I played a stripper in a television show, um, and this time with Daisy Parker. Um, the first thing that I, I try to do is realize that there are real people, some of them I know, who are engaged in this type of work. And, you know, I even had to, you know, really look at my own viewpoints about sex work before doing this because I know that I have my own prejudices that I've had, you know, against people who do this type of work. And that's why becoming informed and doing research was so important for me because so frequently people who engage um, in this type of work aren't there for shits and giggles. It's not like fun work to do. They're there because they don't have any other choices. Um, you know, when you get a script and you're like, oh, she's a crackhead. Oh, she's a hoe. Oh, you know, like immediately it's like, well, I don't want to play that part. Why they got to do that? But like those stories too deserve to be told. And so that's why it needs to be told delicately because someone else could get that and be like, eh, I'm a crackhead, or, you know, like, and not take right. it seriously and not justify with real life experience why this person would be a drug addict or why would this person be a prostitute? Um, go ahead, Michelle. And, and, no, no, no. So, the, you know, you, you're, that character is based on a historical character that we know two things for certain. 
One, she was a sex worker. And two, she had a violent personality and a blade. She got into numerous fights with her blade. So those two things existed, right? Yes. So, right. so you know, outside of that, you know, like now I have to, you know, I have to justify why she's violent. I have to justify why she's doing this work. And because I'm a person of, you know, like with compassion and because I recognize that n nothing is ever as it seems. Like we could just say she's a prostitute and, you know, and just be like, oh, that's what she chose to do. But like, I know from my own experience that there, this thing is layered. You know, I know that as a, as I know as a woman on stage, I don't want to be a good caricature. Like, right. I know that I don't want to play, that's not what I want for myself as an actor, you know? So I want to do these stories that deserve to be told justice by giving them some level of dignity and levity. Um, Absolutely. And the only way for me to do that is to, is to do my research and, and then de decide and justify from a place of dignity why the, this woman is behaving in this way so that she doesn't become some trope, you know, um, cause that's what we don't want. And that's what the, that's what the easy trapping is always in, Absolutely. in television all the time. It's like, as women, we're often asked to be nude and asked to, you know, to have a sex scene sure. and, you know, and I understand when actors and actresses decide not to do those things. If, but if in the writing, especially because Oren Squire didn't write her as a stereotype, he did not you know, like that's not he he did me a service in that he didn't make her a stereotype either. And so it made it a little bit easier for me to find the gravitas for this character so that she didn't just become the comic relief. I mean, because I mean, because I think that part of the genius is that he wrote agency to all of them by by being them the responsible ones who tell the story. Yes. So the moment yes. you see that, it gives that character a power over Louis Armstrong. Yes. So, so in a way, uh, that, that allows never to really become a, a cliche because at the end, it's her empowering, telling a story in a, in, with using smart, educated words. Yes. Uh, understanding things in, co in historical context, etc. Yeah. So, so uh, as a narrator, you are digesting what's happening mm -hmm. and informing the audience with wise, wise uh, uh, you know, synthesis of... Yeah. of so, so that's and that's really, not always the case, you yeah, know, like I definitely, sometimes, sometimes I do get those roles that come through because as women, we're going to get them. They come through and you look at it and you look it on the page. And most often when I see something where somebody wants me to do something that could be dangerously stereotypical, so. I ask them to send me more information send me a script. Like if you get your sides and you're like, ooh, these sides look crazy. I'm like, well, can I see a script? Because if I can put this thing in context and I can make this thing make sense, then I'll go in. But there's definitely been times where I'm like, oh, no, no, no. I, I mean, this, no, I can't do that. <laughs> like, I can't do that. You know, like this, this on, on no levels is this story the right. way it's written right now needing to be right. told by me. You know, um, yeah. but again, these stories, you know, deserve to be told, you know, it just, it just matters how you decide to tell them. Absolutely. So we have a question from Natalie Henry. Natalie, raise her hand. So we are inviting her to talk. Hello. Hello, Natalie. Hi. So um, Hi. I'm 15 and I don't have that much stuff on my resume. And through this webinar, you were talking about how you had to fight to get those labels off of your resume and show what you can truly do. So um, how do you recommend like just getting into the room and having that chance to fight against your resume to prove what you can actually do? So, that's such a good question. So um, there's been a lot of things that I've done um, on my own. Like I'm, I'm a developer of my own work also. Like I've written my own one woman show um, that I performed at the Triad in New York City. Um, I'm, I'm also big and I know a lot of people are not big on this. I'm big on volunteering to participate in projects. And some of the best projects that I've been a part of have been ones that I've volunteered. Um, the Columbia Director Program, um, they, they did Trojan Women 
That's, that's my school. They did Trojan Women, and the director reached out to me, and he asked me if I would play Cassandra. And at this point, who I don't have the, any... Who was the director? Uh, Jeffrey Page. He was in the program was recently. It recently. It was very recently. recently. Yeah, and he reached out and he asked me if I would participate and um, play Cassandra. And I said yes. And now I'm having this opportunity to invite agents and invite directors and casting directors to come see me do a role that right. typically I might not be cast in. And I nailed it. And it was great. Mm -hmm. And you know, like, in the the production was great. And so I, I always tell people, like, find you don't wait for someone to give you the opportunity seek out those opportunities for yourself student films are great ways to um to to get involved and and to start building your reel um developing your own projects you know if you have scenes that you you know love or work that you love find somebody that will be yeah. your scene partner and film it you know like Absolutely. that's you know, like these are ways in which you can start to put yourself out there and get practice in doing it. Like I'm in an acting class once a week, twice a week, and we read plays and that's all we do. We just read plays, we come and we do character study, we read plays off site with each other. So like, if you're really serious about the thing, Never you can find ways. This. Read plays, there, there's nothing better. There is nothing better at your age than read, to read plays. every play that has ever been written. This is the exact right moment to do it. Be familiar, yeah. be familiar with every play. This yeah. It goes a long way. It's a, this and, is you know, and, and, find, and find scene partners and start to do your own script analysis. Start to film your work, you know, like you don't have to wait. So many of the opportunities that I've gotten have been because someone saw me in something that I decided right. to do myself. You know, there was a there was a time when no one would consider me as a singer. You know, like they were like, mm, Dion, mm, she's okay, you know, whatever. And so what I started doing was I was like, oh, okay, so I auditioned for the Apollo. I just went ahead and auditioned for the Apollo. I was like, I'm just gonna audition for the Apollo. And they had a Broadway night and I was like, I'm just gonna do that. And somehow I got in and you know, like, I, j I just went and did it, you know, but then I had footage to then further confirm I do this. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, so like, you know, take the time out to take your opportunity, develop opportunities for yourself, you know, and then you'll have a body of work, you know, so that when people say, well, you don't do this down the third, you have the proof in the pudding. Like, I've been yeah. doing my work. I've been doing it. Right. You know, um, and then in terms of your resume, be creative with your wording. <laughs> well, but she's also young. I mean, I, I mean, this is also you're the, fifteen, the, so like, right? be, of, you know, nobody's expecting a long resume. But, but it's a moment of thinking of what are my next opportunities, what I want my resume to look like in five years. Yeah, I, I think I would try to be focused more on that than on what I did the previous 15 years. Right, because right. you really are in a moment where you're defining where, where do you want to study? You know, what, you know, what are the skills that you want to develop? And, yeah. And, you know, look, Dion has been on Broadway and, and she still goes to acting classes. Everybody does. Everybody needs to keep training uh, yep. to be where they are. Right. So, so, you know, know that. Train now and don't stop ever training. Don't ever stop that. That is so important, you know, just that you touched on that. Like, don't ever stop training because it's not, you're not done. Yeah. You know, like even, even the greatest actors have a coach on set with them. You know, yeah. like they have coaches. Yeah. These actors have, these, these actors that we all want to be like have mm -hmm. a coach. They do. And they talk to them frequently. You, your coach becomes like your therapist. You're like, I talked to you about this thing. Uh, <laughs> you know, so, you know, like don't ever stop training. Thank you so much, Natalie. Thank for you. Natalie. And best of luck. Best of luck. Yes. Thank you. We're excited for your future. All right. So uh, we have a question from our good friend, very good question from our good friend and star of a wonderful world, the great Jason Williams. Um, is asking, when developing a new work, how important it is to make clean and concise choices for yourself versus being open and flexible for your scene partners who are leaving the scene or vice versa? Um, I'm, again, I'm very communicative with the people, you, you know, Jason, you know this, like we, we, we work together, but I think it's an important question to ask 
um, I'm very communicative with my fellow actors. At least I try to be. So if I'm in a scene with somebody, I've, I am going, we're going to talk about it. You know, like we need to be on the same page. I'm not, you know, like I have ideas, you know, but like I can't be in a scene with somebody else and doing this intimate work without having come to an agreement of what we are doing together because we are in this scene together and both of our interests should be served in this moment so that we can best serve the scene. And so, you know, like there, you have to, I think for me, I have to remain flexible um, because I want to make sure that there's three, there's three things happening. The, my scene partner's voice is heard, my voice is heard, and then the voices are then serving the scene and being, you know, being truthful about what's actually happening and serving that the best. And so it's very challenging when you're working with actors that don't want to converse about right. the work. That is, to me, the death of the work, you know, like, I, I just feel like we're in such a vulnerable space. Like, I have to kiss just on in the show. Right. I need to talk to him about that. Now, I'm, you know, I'm not shy about anything, so, like, we can just go for it. But, you know, and uh, there's been situations where I've definitely had to, like, let's slow down what we're doing because we're about to get intimate in this moment, mm -hmm. and everyone needs to feel safe, and everyone needs to know that we're, we're on the same page. I'm not fighting against my singing partners. That's right. Even with Lana, like, me and Lana, you know, what was so interesting is, like, we are at each other's throats. Sure. on that stage but the only way that that works is if we have a good relationship off stage so that this doesn't boil over into something not useful if me and lana didn't get along with each other that scene would have been useless it's only because we discussed the boundaries of this thing and it was definitely a discussion like i don't like this i don't you know like this feels comfortable i'm not comfortable with that and i have to be flexible with that especially because i am the type of actor that, that makes very bold giant bold strokes you know like i'm just like i'm gonna make a choice okay. so but before i do this especially because a lot of my work is so physical because of daisy daisy park is violent sure. i can't just go around slapping people all over the stage you know and there were definitely a couple of times where jason had to be like hey uh can you not uh, can you not Did slap you? me like that <laughs> And I would have to say, you know what, you're right, you know, like, but if I was the type of actor that was like, no, that's what Daisy Parker would do, this is not going to work. This is, we're not, this is not going to be good for the show. So I, I like to stay nice and flexible with my scene partners and come to an agreement, me and you together, off, off site, like I'm a dinner, let's right. sit down with, me and Jason would sit down with our scripts at dinner. And we would talk about like, it out. Okay, it out. what are we doing? What are we saying? Why are we saying these things? Let's talk about what do I want? What do you want? How are we going to serve this? You know, um, don't leave some crying with laughter. <laughs> you know, so, you know, so yeah, I stay flexible and I stay very communicative the whole time. Dion, this was absolutely wonderful, this conversation. I've enjoyed it tremendously. I think people did as well. Great questions. Yes. Um, and, and I, you know, I leave this conversation really motivated to continue the expression of theater, the expression of new characters. I think you gave a lot of really specific, wonderful advice. Um, and I can't wait to have you back on State Thank of you. Quality Theater. Your wig is in place. Yes. Your costume is in place. Your mic, nothing has moved. Everything <laughs> is there waiting for you to return. <laughs> I love it. I'm ready. I'm so ready. And also, I just wanted to say, um, I teach a dance for actors class. Um, and I bring that up because, you know, in the musical theater form, we have to, you know, we frequently have to dance. Um, and I know how challenging that can be for people who don't consider themselves a dancer first. Um, and so I'm teaching a class that really focuses on st st storytelling through choreography. Um, and where so can they find using, information? Where can they um, find? You can find the information on my IG page at DD Figs D D F I G G S, um, and the class is on Thursdays from two to three. So I'll be teaching directly following this class, but it's specifically for people who consider themselves singers or actors first, um, who are just looking to 
you know, increase their dance skills, you know, um, in a safe way and, and, and not feel overwhelmed by the choreography, you know, which can happen in an audition setting. And, and Jessica just on, on the chat, just uh, put her handle DD Fix. If you can just copy that and, 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 and search it and you'll find it. Thank you so much. This was outstanding, Dion. You're magnificent. Uh, for everybody else, go to colony.org to see what are the next uh, a mastermind classes that we have available. Uh, and I look forward to seeing you on stage and everybody else on our next yes. class. Thank you so much, Thank everyone. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you all so much. Bye. Safe.